Amen. And we truly thank God for the precious blood of Jesus for which there is no substitute, no replacement, nothing better, no better option. Because once it flowed on our behalf, it's, it can't be defeated. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We are continuing our the series. Sin the series. Today will be part two. We had the introduction two Sundays ago. Part one was last week. This week is Sin the Series. Part two. And today we're coming from, still coming out of Genesis. Coming from Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I want to read those aloud. Again, from the, I'm reading from the King James Version. I ask you to follow along as I read. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the, son, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, and yet his days shall be 120 years. And there were, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the into the daughters, in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the earth, both man and beast, and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And as we can see, here in Genesis, here in chapter 6, in my Bible, verses 1 through 8, they are th that passage is titled, The Wickedness of Mankind. The Wickedness of Mankind. We are generations removed from the fall. We are generations removed from Eve being deceived and Adam sinning and partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God said, thou shalt not eat. In the day that you do, thou shalt surely die. And in the day that they did eat, they did surely die because separation became, separation came between them and God. Death did surely come because in the partaking of that fruit, man's days began to be numbered. And in the very next generation between Cain and Abel, the brothers, the offspring of Adam and Eve, the perpetuation of the sin sickness that permeated the soul of man in the moment that Adam partook of the fruit, this, it began to manifest itself. And it began to manifest itself when Cain chose to bring an offering before the Lord that was unacceptable. And in that moment, God did not respect Cain's offering. And he confronted Cain and gave Cain the opportunity to make it right. But Cain's heart 
didn't desire to be right with God. Cain's heart sought to take out his frustration. Sought to eliminate the one who called us to his offering. Who he felt caused his offering to be unacceptable before the Lord. So he slayed his brother. And when God asked, where's your brother? His response is, is am, am I my brother's keeper? So, from the partaking of a fruit, a forbidden fruit, to presenting unacceptable sacrifice before God, to now taking of the value of the precious life that he breathed in, and we're only two generations in. The manifestation of the sin, sickness, the sickness of the soul that sin is, is already beginning to manifest itself and, 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 and grow and increase as a disease left unchecked will do. And even though it's a couple of chapters from the curse in chapter three, chapter four, we talked about the one is about Cain and Abel. Chapter 5, the descendants of Adam, the lineage. Even the descendants of Seth are delineated here. Then we get to chapter 6. The generations. The generations that are spoken of here. Man is proliferating throughout the earth, spreading throughout the land. And as man spreads throughout the land, sin, the sickness of sin, it's not increasing, it's not getting worse, but it's getting deeper into who man is. The sin sickness of the soul is is it's it's just permeating that much deeper and making itself more manifest it through, over the, through the generations to where we get to chapter 6. And it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth. Again, spreading out with every generation, the sickness is getting worse. The manifestation is becoming worse. It says that when the sons of God saw the, the, the daughters of men the sons of God is talking about, it's not talking about angels here. Because Jesus said that angels don't come and that angels don't beget themselves. Angels don't do that. That's, that. Those are the words of Christ. The sons of God here, he's talking about the, 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 the descendants of Seth. Because Seth was a godly line. Because Seth's followers, Seth's descendants were followers of God. So there's sons in that respect, not as, as, as we post-cross, <laughs> post the salvation, are sons of God by adoption. These are referred to simply by as sons of God because they follow God, because they obey God. So don't, don't get it confused in thinking that. But it's the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And the daughters of men refers to the lineage of Cain, the descendants of Cain. So you have the devoted followers of God now beginning to see and take the, the, daughters, the, the daughters of men, the descendants of Cain, and they took wives unto themselves. <laughs> all of which they chose. And the blending of the two caused God in verse 3 to say, my spirit will not always strive with man for that he is also flesh and his days shall be 120 years. Now, 
look, 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 look. What, look what he's saying here. Man's days shall be 120 years. This is a significant departure from the, the amount of time that man was living prior to that. Think of the lineages that we were just talking about. Chapter 5, verse 23, and all the days of Enoch were, were 360 and 5 years. And then we have Methuselah, and all the days of Methuselah were 969 years. So we had people living for some extended periods of time, and these are years. This is not seasons. These are years that people were living. Created to be eternal. Created to last. Created to live over some time. 900 years, almost a full millennia. That people were living 800, 700 years, 600 years, half millennia. That people were, 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 were living out years. So, some, of the, some of the men in there were, were living 130, 140 years before they had their first child. So, so time, time again, was not a factor in life. But the moment Adam partook, the death in the separation between man and God was immediate. The death of the physical body the results, it, that, took, that took place. They did not pass away right there, but death now became a part of their existence. And you can see, again, that they're talking about the number of years that, that men lived, but in the day that, God, that they're speaking of here in chapter 6 of Genesis, and God said it's so, it's so grievous unto him that his spirit shall not always strive with man, so he's going to cut down the number of days man has in the earth to 120 years. It says that there were giants in the earth in those days. And when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children with them, and they became mighty men, which were men of old, men of renown. And here's the, here's the verse right here, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is a bad situation. God knew in the moment that he said, let us create man in our image that there would be a need for a savior his plan all along was eternity with our saved souls with our redeemed souls our souls as created were the were, were the they had the created value but after christ we have the redeemed value we have the blood washed Oh, precious is the flow that made us whiter than snow. And us in that whiter, we in that whiter than snow condition have that kingdom value to God. He didn't value the souls pre-Christ any less because that was the, that was the, that was the, they, they had the blood of animals to, you know, to, to, to cover, not wash away, but to cover so that they, so that God could still have relationship with and, 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 but there's that flow, there's that blood, there's that value, there's that, there's that Christ blood value that, that rests upon us, that, that, that is constantly flowing over us as, as, as believers today. But back to verse 5, it says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. The wickedness, the wickedness here in the Hebrew text comes from, from the word ra, R-A, or the word R-A-A-H, ra. -A -H, ra and it means bad or evil in a natural or moral sense. 
It means calamity. It means to displease or displeasure, distress, grief, harm. It has a connotation of a heaviness, hurt, ill favored, mischief, misery, naughty, noisome. Sad, sore, sorrow, trouble, vexing, worst, wretchedness, or wrong. So do you understand what the word is saying here when it says the wickedness of man was great in the earth? Think back to the moment back in the garden. In the moment when now, after Eve has been deceived and after Adam has partaken, 100% of humanity in existence is now separated from God. 100%. But in the early stages of his plan, of what he knew, he was, he was hurt, he was disappointed, but he knew that it had to happen. But God's not emotionless. God's not without feeling. He knew that it had to happen. But in the moment that 100% of humanity was separated from him, it didn't cause him what humanity had caused him here in verse 5. It did not cause him what humanity had caused him. In verse 3, my spirit shall not always strive with man so that I'm going to cut down his days. So his spirit, what, what, what happened in the garden, even with Cain slaying his brother, even with Cain offering unacceptable sacrifice, didn't move God to that point. But the progression the proliferation, the propagation of the disease through the generations with man living several centuries, man living almost a full millennia. The time that the sickness of sin had to permeate, to propagate, to make itself known in the lives of men Any disease, any malaf any, any affliction that goes on in the body left unchecked, left unattended, is going to begin to spread and cause detriment within the body, no matter what it is. It's not just going to go away on its own. The body is capable of healing itself, but a disease a, 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 an infirmity like that, 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 that comes in and is working directly against the body, left unchecked, is going to deteriorate the body. <laughs> Tooth decay. If you don't brush your teeth, if you don't take care of your teeth, what's going to happen? You're going to go bad, you're going to fall out, you're going to have bad breath, you're going to be gumbling, you're going to be too, <laughs> and it, it's just going to be bad. If you have an infection and it's not treated, what happens? It's going to spread through the body. Even the big C, even cancer. If they catch it in the early stages and it's treatable, and they go in and do whatever procedure you know they need to do it and remove it, and it's gone. It can come back, but it can be mitigated. Certain things, but there's a the, the, the sense of urgency to, to catch and detect in early stages so that it can be eradicated, so that it can be, but that was never God's intent with sin. It was never God's intent with sin to eradicate it from the earth. But it advanced. 
advances and it grows, expands, and spreads, and manifests itself to a point. In verse 5, that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And how prevalent was it? How distinct was it in the life of, of man, mankind, of man? The wickedness of man was so great in the earth that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. That's a whole lot of evil going on. That's a whole lot of evil going on in the lives of mankind. That the imagine that every imagination of the thought of the heart that's way deep down on the inside. That's not a superficial contemplation of, well, maybe I should. What would happen if I did? That we're, 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 we're levels, levels, levels way beyond that. That's a point of, I'm going to do this and I don't care what anybody else says. That's an, I'm going to get what I want at any cost. That's the level of wickedness that was taking place. And it was taking place all the time. It wasn't the straight-laced person thinking, okay, I'm just going to break this rule this one time. And I'll, you know, and I won't do it again. That's not the occasional lawbreaker. That's not the 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 the, the, the your, your 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 good child that has a bad moment. <laughs> the every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil. Continue. That's throughout mankind. The only thing being entertained. The only thing being pursued, the only thing drawing and capturing the attention of man was evil, was wicked, was self at any cost. Because evil Wickedness, this level of wickedness isn't done on behalf of others. It's done for self, for personal gain. Even if another person comes and asks you, okay, I need you to go do this to this person and I'll give you this much or I'll do this for you. Personal gain. Self. Self. Every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. Rules, laws of the land, statutes meant nothing. They existed. They had to exist because there had to be something to measure against. If there are no rules, if there are no laws, then there can't be lawlessness. If there's no laws, then everything is lawful and you're okay. And the sheriff can hang up his badge. <laughs> but as soon as laws, as soon as rules, as soon as moral standards, as soon as natural law is, is in place, now there's something by which to say, okay, this is wrong. Okay, you're falling short. Okay, you're missing the mark. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually.
continually. Only evil continually. There was no break. There was no letting up. There was no turning away from evil. There was no <laughs> lifting up. There was no relenting. There was no letting go of evil for any period of time. Only evil continually. And the best definition I have for evil is just the absence of God. Not good, but God. God is good. Where God does not exist, there is evil. So every abat, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only the absence of God continually. Sin had so manifested itself within the souls of men. Sin had so permeated, propagated itself throughout the community of humanity. that it was now the rule, that it was now the way of life. Verse six says, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. It repented the Lord. And the word here repented here in the Hebrew text isn't the word that we think of when we think of repentance. As Jesus preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That repentance is a change of mindset, a change of the way you think, a change, a, a 180 degree turn away from sin and back to God. God is not having to repent here of sin. God is not having to change his mindset. But the word repent here in the Hebrew text is nacham, N-A-C-H-A-M, nacham. And it means to sigh or to breathe strongly, to be sorry, to rue or to regret. And again, to repeat, none of this is a surprise to God. He knows this is all part of his plan of salvation, but he did not implement this plan oblivious to the fact that he would have to experience these emotions, that he would go through these things with humanity. Much the way a parent, when they decide to have children, even the mother knowing that the, what pregnancy in itself of, it entails, the, the growth of the child, the, 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 the gestation, the, the, the birthing of the child, the, the, the pains involved, but, it, but, but in the moment that the child is, is birthed into the world, and that mother gets to hold that child for the first time, that joy outweighs everything else. That joy outweighs everything else. And then the question, if you ask the mother at the moment of the final push, do you think you'll have another child? <laughs> You, you, you might not get 100% affirmative, you know, from that. But in that moment when that mother gets to hold that child for the first time afterward, ask her then. And you might, that's when you might, you're, you're most likely to get a heart. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, yes. Yes. Yeah, oh, yes. But for every moment like that, that we have as humans. For every moment that we have the joys of rearing those children, watching them go through those times, 
having to go through potty training, knowing that the goal is that your child learns how to properly use the restroom, but the frustrations along the way, the accidents, the having to clean this child again who's big enough to be able to use the, the, the bathroom, but, but is not quite grasping or, or not getting it and hasn't gotten it yet. But then in the moment when that child gets it and grasps it now, and you've gone through that stage and that satisfaction is there. See, God knows the joy of birthing us, breathing life into Adam. He knows God knows the joy now of watching us receive Christ. He knows that joy. He knows that. He knows the, 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 the frustration of potty training us <laughs> as believers. He knows the, the joy of, of, of watching us learn to walk. But he knows the frustration of us going through, the, through our teen years where we know so much. But he also knows the joy of us getting through that and seeing him through the eyes that say, oh yes, you are God. You do know it all. You are the answer to everything. See, I, and I, I remember my teen years, when I, I went through that time, when I felt like I, I knew more than my parents, that I knew more than, 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 than my mom, that, that I was so much smarter than all the adults because in my 16 years, and in my, in, my, in my numerous teenage years, I had experienced so much that I knew more than all these adults who had lived two, three, four <laughs> times as long as I had. But I knew everything. <laughs> but if I knew now what I knew then, I would have shut up. <laughs> My head wouldn't have been quite as big, you know, full of, full of puffed up knowledge, okay? But again, that's the same thing God goes through. And we as parents know that we're going to go through those things. But we choose to have children. We as parents, because, because the good outweighs the bad. Because the joy outweighs the sorrow. And I mean outweighs. Not outnumbers, but it outweighs. It outweighs. Because in the moment when, that, when we realize that our child is potty trained, that they got it, that moment right there is the moment but it doesn't outnumber the days it took, the hours and the minutes, the attempts, the failures, the, the cleanings, the cleanups. None of that is as long as that moment of, okay, you got it now. But that moment outweighs, outweighs all of the failures, frustrations, cleanings, cleanups, and all of that. See, if I'm a scale, this is outweighing that moment of, of, of success. Outweigh. And that's what God is saying. That's what God is looking at. That's what God is dealing with with us as his children. That's what God is dealing with with us as humanity as he created us. Because of the joys. But here in verse 6, it says, It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So here is creation. Children of creation. Here his creation has now gotten to the point. We're hard-headed, rowdy teenagers doing what we want to do. And I say we, we as human beings now. We're doing what we want to do. Rules, regulations, none of that means anything. Because it's now all about us doing what we want to do. And it grieved him at his heart. It grieved him at his heart. Verse 7 it says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast. And the creeping thing in the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Repent. It, it, it causes that, that sigh. <sighs> that 
breathing strongly. <sighs> Can you imagine God doing that as he looks down on the earth and he sees that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart are only evil continually. And imagine God would But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Ten words. <laughs> but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In all of scripture, <laughs> This is the first time grace is mentioned. This is the first time that unmerited favor is mentioned. This is the first time that grace is mentioned. Christ hasn't yet gone to the cross. But Noah found grace in the eyes of of the Lord. And I'm going to read from my notes here in the Bible. It says, this is the first occurrence of the word grace in scripture. Its root meaning is to bend or to stoop, implying condescending or unmerited favor of a superior person to an inferior one. Hmm. Noah found grace, unmerited favor, un merited favor in the eyes of the Lord and with everything that was going on in the imaginations of the hearts of, of, of all of mankind only evil continually Noah found grace Noah found grace it doesn't say Noah was living perfectly Noah found grace. It doesn't say that, you know, Noah was, was, was exemplary. Noah was, no, Noah found grace. <laughs> he had a godly ancestor in Enoch who found grace. Enoch walked with God. Enoch, Enoch separated himself from the wickedness of his contemporaries and followed the Lord. That's, that's, from, that's from the notes as well. And I just, and I, it just, it's, it sticks out so. Because to, 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 to garner that, that comparison, Noah was a light shining in a dark place where the wickedness of mankind was grieving man, God's heart to where he declares that he's going to destroy mankind. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
Noah wasn't living his life saying, you know what? Y'all are evil. God's going to get you. If you don't change, you, you, y'all, y'all need to straighten up because you're bad. Noah saw what was going on. Noah chose not to be a part of what was going on. Noah chose not to be like what was going on. It says he separated himself from the wickedness of his contemporaries and followed God. It was his following God that separated him. He did not geographically separate himself. He did not isolate himself. He did not run away from where evil was taking place. He did not run away from the imaginations and the thought of the thoughts of the heart being only, he didn't try to, he wasn't running away from evil people and evil place. He was turning away from. He was turning away from and following God with the wickedness being in rampant as it was throughout the land, there was nowhere he could go anyway. Because <laughs> it, was, it was all around him. But his heart was for God. His mindset was to follow God. He wasn't just checking boxes, trying to earn favor with God. He was following God. In his heart, in his not running from evil, but his turning from evil, <laughs> in his choice, not to be like the world. It's like the, 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 he's living the New Testament words before they're saying he is in the world but not of the world. He's living for God in the midst of all this wickedness. And he finds grace with God. Not finds it in a way that he was looking for grace. But he was following God. Following God and he found grace. Living for God and he found grace. That's like me just going to clean out my closet and, you know, just look, looking to straighten up, looking to, 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 to declutter. And I go through the pockets of a coat and I find $10. I wasn't looking for $10. I was trying to clean up. I was trying to declutter. And I, I found 10 bucks. And that, 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 that goes, that's a positive, that comes from, from that. Moses, Moses, <laughs> not Moses, Noah, Noah, Noah was trying to, his only thing was, I need to follow God. I need to follow God. He wasn't trying to avoid, he wasn't trying to avoid God's wrath. That wasn't the concern. Because if you're doing things to just try to avoid God's wrath, then you're not following God for who he is. The loving God that wants relationship with us. If you're doing things to avoid his wrath, then all you're doing is trying to appease the image of God being the old crotchety man sitting on his front porch waiting to yell at kids to get off his grass. But that's not God. If you're following God because you love God, because you want relationship with him, then trying to avoid his wrath is not the concern. Because if, if you do that, you automatically avoid his wrath. 
if you do that, if you live in that way, just wanting to please him, just wanting to have a relationship with him, just wanting to be in good standing with him, then guess what? You will find grace in his eyes. You will find grace. Look for God and you will find grace. Live according to his love and you will find grace. Follow God because you love him and you will find grace. The disease, the sickness of sin is preventing mankind from reaching out to God from seeing God, from following God, from even acknowledging God because the every imagination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. But Noah was keeping the sickness, the disease at bay by following God. His treatment of the sin was to follow God. His inability to be affected to that degree, to the degree that all of mankind, all the rest of mankind was being affected was because he followed God. Sin is powerful. Sin can be rampant. But even here in the Old Testament, just generations from the garden, generations closer to the garden than to the cross sin is kept at bay by following God sin is kept at bay Noah is living the words of David how can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word by living according to what he knows will please God not in an effort to avoid wrath, but in an effort to press in and get to know better. In an, in an effort to, to, to seek who God was, Enoch walked with God in such a way that God was like, oh, come on, come on up, son, come on up. You don't even have to stop breathing. You don't even have to die. Just, just come on up. And comparatively speaking, Noah's life stood out to God in the midst of all, in, in the midst of all of humanity. Noah's life, again, was a light shining in a dark place. God could look down and in the darkness and in the wickedness of the imagination of the thoughts of the hearts of men, evil, only evil, continually, he could look down and Noah's life stood out because he followed God, because he reflected God, because he gave God something he could see. Jesus told the, the woman of the well, God is seeking those who worship him in, in spirit and in truth. Noah was worshiping God in a manner that got God's attention, in a manner that, that when God was looking out over all this grievous activity with his heart grieved, Noah carried himself. Noah lived, Noah worshiped in a manner that 
called out to God, that cried out to God, where the sin, the noisomeness of the sin is crying out to God and it's shouting at God in God's face and it's 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 laughing and, 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 and exalting itself before God saying here and, and you can't do anything about this because I've got this. Noah's worship. Noah's worship said here I am. Like the song we sing, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Oh. Here I am to say that you're my God. Here, it, it, Noah's worship stood out. Noah's life stood out because he followed God. So, again, just generations from the garden. The sickness of sin, the soul sickness is spreading and it's deteriorating the body to the point where God says, I'm, I'm going to destroy this. I've got to do something about this. And Noah, Noah found grace. Noah found grace on a historic timeline. generations and then the generations and the generations and the wickedness and the evil and the, the wickedness of man's hearts <laughs> towards only evil all the time and God says I'm going to destroy this but Noah found grace the human race got filtered back down to Noah they don't go history Noah, Ham, Shem and Japheth became God's filters became God's filters for humanity to start over again, to start over again. Sin wasn't eliminated because they still had a sinful soul. But their worship of God, but their worship of God kept the sin sickness from spreading, kept the sin sickness from becoming you know, epidemic in their body. Yes. So, we know that, again, God knew all of this was going to happen. But it was all part of his plan to get us to eternity with him, worshiping, fellowshipping, in a level of spiritual intimacy that cannot be achieved here on earth. It can only be achieved once we in his presence and that was that was the plan from the beginning the garden was never the final plan it was just the launching point for it the sin that came God knew it was going to happen but he also knew what, well, what he would have to go through in order to get to eternity with us and on an eternal scale <laughs> the the 7,000 years of, 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 of human existence on God's eternal scale is like that. <laughs> but to him, every second from creation to the triumphal return of Christ is worth it because of what he's going to have in the end. You know, those redeemed, saved souls. So for as strong and as powerful a sin as God's God's got the answer. God is the answer. And the answer is in Jesus Christ. The answer is in Jesus Christ. He is the cure for the sin sick soul. As we shared earlier, he is the cure for the sin sick soul. He's the injection that doesn't need a booster. <laughs> Once we say yes, we get that Holy Spirit on the inside. wipes it out. We go from having that sin sick soul that is in need of restoration, that's in need of redemption, 
to when we say yes, that Holy Spirit comes in and we are renewed in Christ and we are made new. Behold, old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. There's a newness now. There's a the regening that takes place and now we begin to grow in Christ. Now we begin to grow as the new sons of God, the adopted sons of God that are in him now and, and pressing towards that eternal intimacy with God that we enjoy just as much here now but it'll be greater magnified and increased once we pass on into that life with him in eternity so Jesus is the answer as long as it's for the world today above him there's no other <laughs> we he's the way he said he's the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by him so we don't have to fear sin. We don't have to, even in those times when we find ourselves having disobeyed, having fallen short, having missed the mark, the blood of Jesus, we go right back before God. We go right back before God. And that stain is washed away. The stain is washed away. The righteous man falls seven times. Falls seven times. So even the righteous man is not without mistakes, is not without sin, is not without falling short, is not without missing the mark. The righteous man, but guess what the righteous man has to do? He's got to get back up. If you fall seven times, you get back up seven times. You get back up seven times. Six times is a failure. Seven times. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Why all the corruptness? Why all the madness? Why all the chaos going on in the world? Sin. Sin. What can wash away my sins? Jesus. The blood of Jesus. He is the answer. A hundred percent. 100%. He's the answer. I'm just going to read through this one more time, and we're going to close with the word of prayer. Verses 5 through 8. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will, destroy the, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your justness. We thank you for your joy, Father God. We thank you for your strength. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have imparted to us and have bestowed upon us because we are your children, because we are believers, Father God. All of these things that you've given to us, that you've imparted to us, that you've bestowed upon us, Father God, the world cannot take them away because they didn't give them to us, Lord. They are from you. So we hold on to them, Father God, as unto life itself. They are the means by which we live because these are the things you give us to get through this life, Father God. And we are grateful to you. We are thankful to you, O oh Lord, for all of this, Father. Thank you for visiting your presence upon us, with us today, O oh God. Thank you for bridging the gap that is between us and any other believers who are worshiping at this time, Father God, in this, which is your day, the day that you have made, we will rejoice and be glad in it, oh God. But thank you for your presence. Thank you for your unbroken promise to never leave us nor forsake us, oh God. Thank you, oh Lord for the privilege of being able to worship you. Thank you, God, for the privilege of being able to be called your children. Your children because of Jesus, your adopted loved ones, Lord. We ask, dear God, that you watch over us and keep us. 
Keep your hedge of protection around us, Father God, even until the time where we choose and purpose to gather together again as we transition our worship We're now from the corporate, Father God, back to the individual. We ask that you watch over us and keep us. Pray in God that as we encounter people throughout this week, Lord, that we would see them with your eyes of love, hear them with ears filtered with your understanding, God, and we would speak only as the Holy Spirit leads us and unctions us to, dear God. Again, thank you for receiving our worship today. Thank you for being enthroned upon our praise. We give you honor, glory, and praise. Thanking you for all things. In Jesus' holy and precious name, Father, we say amen.